Thank you very much. Uh, uh, and thanks again who uh, are joining us right now. Uh, so we are coming to the last session, but not the least is uh, on the cardiology and one talk on the postnatal depression, which is also uh, is a very, very important topic. So without further ado, uh, I, will, uh, I would like to introduce my friend, my brother, my colleague, who is working with me in SSNC um, Mayo Clinic Hospital in Abu Dhabi, Dr. Sayyid Ali Raza. He's graduated from the uh, National Medical College from Pakistan. And then he uh, did his post-graduation in UK. He worked in various uh, positions in England uh, and training in pediatrics and neonatology in southwest of the England. He joined uh, Abu Dhabi in Mafra Hospital in 2013. He developed his interest in the cardiology. He's actually the core uh, uh, pediatric and neonatal echocardiography in our unit. And he's doing a very excellent job in that. He's also developed interest in neonatal mechanical ventilation. He's a core faculty of pediatric residency program in the same hospital and extensively involved in teaching and quality project in the department. Dr. Ali Raza, over to you. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Junaid. That was very nice introductions. Uh, but before I uh, start the session, I really want to congratulate you. It's a very well organized uh, teaching co uh, con neonatal conference and really very excellent high quality uh, related to our day-to-day -day need to practice like all the lectures are. Uh, our first presenter is uh, Dr. John Berker. He is a medical director, pulmonary hypertension program and cardiac uh, ECMO uh, in Children's National Hospital. Uh, he did his fellowship in pediatric critical care medicines and in pediatric cardiology about 20 years back. Uh, apart from that, he is uh, he been an, an he's an investigator and co-investigator in pediatric collaborative critical care research network funded by the National Institute of Health. His main interests are management of critical cardiac disease in children and neonates, advanced heart failure, ECMO, and pediatric pulmonary hypertension. Uh, he's going to give us talk to uh, delivery room management of critical congenital heart disease. Uh, all over to you, Dr. John, please. Good evening. I want to thank the organizers for allowing me to speak on neonates with congenital heart disease, delivery room resuscitation. My name is John Berger, and I come from the Children's National Hospital in Washington, D.C. I do not have any relevant financial disclosures. The objectives of my talk today are to discuss the importance of during a pregnancy to term, to discuss common therapies used in the cardiac resuscitation of a baby with congenital heart disease, and review patient populations that require immediate cardiac intervention. The first consideration in caring for children with congenital heart disease or fetuses with congenital heart disease is planning the timing of delivery. And it is important uh, that these babies deliver at term. We know from many studies that premature birth and low birth weight are very hazardous for infants with congenital heart disease. And, they, and that uh, early birth and underweight birth um, carry substantial mortality and morbidity risks. In this study, looking at Patients in the Society of Thoracic Surgeons database from 2002 to 2004, uh, the authors asked the question, is low birth weight associated with increased surgical mortality? 
In this study of 3,000 patients, 517 weighed less than 2.5 kilos at birth. And the risk of death for those patients had an odds ratio, increased odds ratio of 1.5 to 3 times higher rate of death or odds of death uh, if weighing less than 2.5 kilos. Uh, the odds varied based on the severity of the congenital heart disease. Um, and the highest odd was actually seen in the lowest, lower category um, or lower complexity congenital heart disease. But even near term or late preterm uh, birth is associated with increased uh, mor morbidity and mortality. In another Society of Thoracic Surgeons Congenital Heart Disease database study, there were 4,784 patients who had a cardiac operation at less than 28 days of age. 48% of those patients were born before 39 weeks. And the authors in this study analyzed the data by gestational age between 34 and 40 weeks to see the effect of gestational age on mortality, morbidity, and length of stay. And using 39 weeks as a reference value, the odds of mortality, odds ratio for mortality increased to 1.34 if the infants were born as little as two weeks earlier. And this was statistically significant. Postoperative length of stay uh, was also longer in children born earlier, as was the number of complications. What sort of complications did these children have? In a single center study, uh, looking at approximately 100 uh, infants uh, or newborns with congenital heart disease, uh, infants who were born at late preterm compared to term were obviously born with less uh, birth weight. They had a longer preoperative hospitalization. They weighed less at the time of their surgery. They were more likely to be uh, require preoperative vasoactive agents. They had a much higher incidence of necrotizing intercolitis, seizures, feeding disturbance, and they had a much higher mortality rate. The other important consideration about delaying birth uh, to term in children with congenital heart disease is that we know that the brains of babies with congenital heart disease have delayed maturation. In an MRI study uh, looking at white matter maturation uh, index, uh, the study showed that uh, infants with congenital heart disease born between uh, 37 and 41 weeks had brain maturation, um, white matter maturation equivalent to an infant born between 36 and 37 weeks um, in patients with hypoplastic left heart syndrome or detransposition of the great vessels. And we know that immature brains are more vulnerable to both ischemic uh, and hemorrhagic injury uh, and periventricular leukomalacia is seen in children with congenital heart disease, um, similar patterns uh, to those who are born prematurely. So maintaining uh, a pregnancy until delivery is one of the key uh, takeaways uh, from this talk. Well, let's talk about delivery planning. What are the variables to consider when uh, planning for a baby with cardiac disease? Well, the primary uh, variable to consider is the risk of hemodynamic instability at birth or in the delivery room. However, you also have to take into consideration the resources of the region. That means both um, technical resources, for example, the availability of ECMO or uh, catheter-based interventions at a cardiac center, uh, as well as the personnel, uh, cardiac intensivists, the availability of cardiologists, cardiac surgeons, um, and transport teams. Uh, there has to be a consideration for obstetric complications, um, obviously vaginal versus uh, cesarean uh, delivery, 
there is important um, morbidity differences uh, for the mother. We've discussed the timing uh, and well as mode of delivery. So what the first thing to understand about caring for newborns with congenital heart disease is that routine resuscitation in, congenital, in the infants with congenital heart disease is usually that's all that required. Um, most congenital heart disease is well tolerated in utero. Uh, the placenta is an excellent uh, substitute for extracorporeal oxygenation or ECMO. Um, rarely are specialized treatments required. And if intervention is required, it is usually the normal newborn ABCs, airway, breathing, and circulation uh, paradigms. Uh, but when needed, cardiac care uh, is highly specialized and means thinking uh, about zebras and not horses or camels. So the real, uh, the real challenge for the cardiac center is to identify uh, the high, ultra high risk patient and provide uh, consultation and strategies uh, to the delivery hospitals about caring for uh, these infants. As I said, most of the time, uh, infants with congenital heart disease do not require resuscitation. And if they do, it's nothing more than uh, normal ABCs. Um, in a study looking at 110 infants with congenital heart disease who had a neonatologist at delivery, only 10% required additional resuscitation beyond the normal newborn stimulation and care. Uh, and this is actually no different than infants without congenital heart disease. Well, working at an uh, advanced cardiac center as I do, we have developed for our center um, a stratification system uh, based on the risk of instability at birth. Um, and the, this risk stratification system uh, extends from a level one to a level four, um, uh, level four being the most uh, high risk uh, group of infants. Patients with, who are deemed to be without risk of instability in the uh, delivery room or so-called level one patients. Uh, examples of that are ventricular septal defect, complete atrial ventricular canal defect, and mild tetralogy. All um, infants who should uh, look relatively uh, and act relatively normal at birth. Uh, patients in this risk category are delivered at their local hospital um, with um, uh, uh, um, uh, routine uh, obstetrical care um, and routine delivery room care. And these babies can be evaluated as outpatient within the neonatal cardiology uh, consult. Level two infants are those that have minimal risk of having instability in the operating room. And these often include uh, ductal dependent lesions such as severe coarctation of the aorta, interrupted aortic arch, and severe tetralogy of Fallot. Um, consideration is often given to having these uh, planned induction for these children so that uh, trans transport to the cardiac center can uh, occur in a timely fashion. Uh, a neonatologist is often in the delivery room, and PGE or prostaglandin E uh, is started as indicated. And the patients are semi-electively transported to the cardiac center uh, for surgery and intervention. Level three infants, on the other hand, are those infants who are likely to need immediate uh, delivery room stabilization. Um, often these are the babies where we're not quite sure whether they're gonna be sick in the delivery room or not. Um, or those infants where routine initial care will stabilize the baby. Um, uh, in these infants, we usually recommend planned induction. Uh, occasionally, we'll recommend a cesarean section type of delivery if there's a need to coordinate the care uh, 
between the cardiac center um, and the um, a delivery hospital. There will be a neonatologist in the delivery room. We will often send a specialist from the cardiac center, either a cardiologist with an interest uh, in delivery room management or a cardiac intensivist uh, to the delivery room to assist in the resuscitation. Um, there is a planned rapid transport to the cardiac center uh, with an aim of being in the cardiac center within a half an hour of delivery. And typical types of heart disease that uh, require this kind of care are um, infants with detransposition of the great vessels, infants with uncontrolled arrhythmias, and those infants with heart failure secondary to uh, congenital heart loss. Level four um, types of infants um, are generally uh, children who have uh, obstructed pulmonary venous return. When there's sort of three uh, prototypical uh, types of congenital heart disease, there are those infants who have detransposition of the great vessels or DTGA with an intact ventricular septum and a restrictive atrial septum. There are infants who have hypoplastic left heart syndrome and an intact atrial septum. And in both of these lesions, um, the children uh, quickly develop uh, lung congestion and pulmonary edema, and so develop a profound acidosis, uh, both re respiratory and metabolic, as well as profound cyanosis. Similarly, those infants who have a total lumbus pulmonary venous uh, return or um, with obstruction, uh, will also have this same combined pattern of cardiorespiratory failure uh, and will quickly all proceed to cardiogenic shock and, this, and extreme hypoxemia. So the, the three physiologic groups, the first are those babies with pulmonary venous obstruction who develop senescence and respiratory failure. There are babies who have uh, in utero heart failure and high drops, either from arrhythmia, Epstein's anomaly, or complete heart block and cardiomyopathy. And then finally, those babies who will have uh, severe airway obstruction and or pulmonary hypoplasia as a result of their congenital heart disease. In our center, uh, level four are those infants requiring immediate care are delivered uh, at the cardiac facility. In our center, that is one of the cardiac operating rooms. This allows for immediate access to cardiac catheterization, um, balloon atrial septostomy or other uh, methodologies to open up the atrial system, as well as the ability to put the patient onto uh, ECMO either before delivery or right afterwards. Um, these uh, deliveries are often planned cesarean sections to coordinate the cardiac care between the different teams. Um, and our teams are always prepared, uh, but not always needed in this situation. Some of the keys to success, if you're going to embark on caring for these highest risk uh, infants, you do need to have a full set of treatment options. Uh, you never know exactly uh, what you're going to need um, until after the baby's born. That includes uh, typical things that we see in the CICU, vasoactive agents, uh, nitric oxide, um, catheter-based techniques to open up the atrial septum, as well as the availability of ECMO. Another very, very important consideration um, is the realization that you are activating and bringing together multiple teams, all with sub-team leaders, um, so that you have a maternal team that is focused on uh, delivering the baby and the mother's well-being, you have the delivery team who's uh, focused on resuscitating the baby, a transport team, an ICU team, which is often uh, involved in decision-making regarding ECMO use, a cath team, the diagnostic team, um, as well as anesthesia uh, uh, and surgical teams uh, for placing patients on ECMO. And obviously this requires clear, clear communication um, and frequent practicing uh, of, uh, of the delivery um, in high fidelity simulations. 
Um, when we uh, carry out one of these level four deliveries, we have um, very th well thought out uh, process maps uh, that tell us where uh, and what's going to happen in each phase of the delivery, as well as maps to show where all the different players are to stand uh, during each phase of the delivery. Um, and in our institution, in one of the, uh, these deliveries, it's often upwards of 20 or more people who are involved in the delivery of the infant. Uh, we did a review of our deliveries, uh, both of level three and level four infants uh, carried out in our institution between 2005 and 2012. In that time period, we had 15 level three deliveries uh, and 19 uh, level four uh, babies born. Only 12 out of those 19 infants, however, were born uh, as planned at Children's National Hospital. Uh, of the babies delivered uh, in the level three group, approximately half or eight required immediate cardiac intervention. Uh, eight out of eight had a blue natural septostomy. One of the eight required ECMO. And the mean time or the median time to intervention was of almost two hours in that group. With a level four type planning, uh, 16 or 84% of the 19 infants required uh, immediate intervention. 13 of those interventions were septostomy, two were ECMO. And the median time to intervention uh, was cut approximately in half uh, using a level four strategy uh, versus a level three. And all of these infants uh, uh, survived um, and had their operations uh, at, for congenital heart disease as planned. So what constitutes routine cardiac care in the delivery room? What, what do you need as a neonatologist to be prepared for? Well, the two most common questions that I get as the cardiac specialist from the neonatologist is, should I start prostaglandin E1 um, and should I give the baby oxygen? So to answer the first question, if you're in doubt, start it. Um, there are relatively few downsides and relatively few side effects to starting prostaglandins. However, starting prostaglandins in the delivery room is not an emergency. The ductus is open and usually will remain open um, uh, in the delivery room. Uh, in an echographic cardiographic study looking at ductal closure in normal uh, term infants, only 8% of the ductuses were closed on the uh, day of delivery uh, echocardiogram. And it wasn't until two, days two to four that ductal closure was fully achieved. Um, and so you have some time to get the an IV placed and the prostaglandin shot. Um, whether you should give the baby oxygen or not, depends on what the saturation goal is and the cardiac center should be providing you a saturation goal uh, in the initial, uh, as part of their initial consultation uh, with you. Some of the things that you should uh, learn from your cardiac center about each of the babies um, with a prenatal diagnosis, you wanna know whether there's one or two ventricles uh, and what the heart function is. But more importantly, you want to know how blood flow is going to get to the body, how blood flow is going to get to the lung, because that's going to determine whether you need to have prostaglandins available and whether you need to keep the ductus open. You also want to know uh, whether there's any risk of obstruction in the blood returning from the lungs, because if there is pulmonary, uh, pulmonary venous obstruction, either at the vein level or the atrial level, that infant can quickly develop pulmonary edema and respiratory failure. Uh, and, and will the respirations be? So using prostaglandins, the original dose, if you read the literature, uh, is 0 0.1 mics per kilo per minute. That is usually not necessary in the delivery room, but you can get equal e efficacy at a much lower dose and then therefore have less side effects. Um, uh, in uh, most cardiac centers, 
doses greater than 0.02 mics per kilo per minute are only rarely used. Um, and if used, you have much uh, higher likelihood of the infant developing apnea and requiring intubation. Additionally, higher doses are associated with necrotizing endocolitis uh, and the need for mechanical ventilation. And the 0.1 mic per kilo per do minute dose is really a dose that I only use when um, it's necessary to open the ductus arteriosus after it is closed at several days of age. What about oxygenation in the single ventricle patient? What's the oxygen saturation goal? This is a very common question. And it, these are patients, to break it down into simple physiology, these are patients who have both systemic and pulmonary venous return, returning to a single pumping chamber with a single outflow, and that admixed blood is then partitioned between the body and returning to the lungs. And if you send too much blood to the lungs, you're going to have uh, too little blood flow to the body. And so the real goal here is oxygen delivery, not oxygen uh, saturation or oxygen content. And so if you plot oxygen delivery based on arterial saturation in patients with single ventricle anatomy, there is a sweet spot or an ideal saturation somewhere between 75 and 85% which will maximize oxygen delivery to the body. If your saturations are too high, you are sending excessive blood to the lungs in order to get the saturation that high um, and potentially uh, reducing the amount of blood flow to the body and therefore have um, inadequate oxygen delivery. Clearly, if the patients are very cyanotic, there's not enough oxygen content um, and um, the babies are equally uh, compromised. What is the specialized care that I can, uh, I, can, my, I can provide and my team can provide? There are basically two things in the delivery room or shortly after delivery is either ECMO, again, either before delivery in an exit type procedure or shortly afterwards, and atrial decompression using a variety of uh, um, if we look at how, uh, the importance of these interventions uh, in, for example, looking at atrial subtostomy, in patients who have DTGA or detransposition of the great vessel and a restrictive atrial septum, um, 12, in, a, in a study looking at 295 infants with this uh, issue, 12 of the 295 infants died before surgery. All of these infants had profound hypoxemia from a restrictive atrial septum. None were prenatally diagnosed. Uh, two out of 11 responded, only two out of 11 responded to PGE with a small rise in arterial saturation. Uh, eight patients out of the 12 had a balloon atrial septostomy. However, the time to septostomy was 7 point, 17 and a half hours. And again, this is uh, very long. Uh, in patients who have such profound hypoxemia and acidosis, and four died before they could get to the neutral septostomy. So again, patients with DTGA, you're going to want to have a plan to deliver them close to the cardiac center, if not in the cardiac center, uh, to get them to um, intervention to prevent early death. The same can be said for patients with hypoplastic left heart syndrome and atrial restriction. Um, However, the results are less robust uh, given the severity of the in overall severity of the congenital heart disease. Um, uh, and um, the survival of these infants uh, in this series was only 50%, uh, but 50% compared to zero if you do not do uh, uh, an atrial um, intervention. So, in uh, conclusion, uh, I hope that I have uh, given you uh, the tools to understand that the key anatomy in understanding the physiology of babies in the, op in the delivery room or whether the baby has one or two ventricles, uh, how the blood gets to the body, how the blood gets to the lungs, and importantly, how the blood gets from the lungs back to the heart. Uh, oxygen is neither good nor bad, but 
uh, knowing the correct oxygen saturation goal is important. Um, for those caring for the highest risk babies, you need to have a full complement of therapy options, uh, including ECMO. Uh, and most importantly, your team needs to prepare and actually practice uh, caring for these um, very complex and fragile babies. And again, I want to thank the organizers for the opportunity to speak uh, today. Thank you very much, Dr. John. Uh, it was an excellent talk, really guiding us in organizing our thoughts and approach to these complex patients. Uh, now we move to our uh, next speaker, which is Dr. Gerard Martin. He is a pediatric cardiologist and medical director for Global Services and has been in pediatric practice at Children's National Health System since 1986. He has his training at the Cardiovascular Research Institute at the University of California, San Francisco. Really, he's, he's internationally renowned uh, pediatric cardiologist having a great commitment for uh, pediatric cardiology teaching and training and has got extensive uh, publications. He's an advocate for congenital heart disease efforts nationally and internationally. He, he played integral role in the development of critical congenital heart disease screening and the subboard of adult congenital heart disease in states. He has been a volunteer on medical missions to developing countries. So he, he is going to give us a talk on update on new recommendation for critical congenital heart disease screening using pulse optimetry. So over to Dr. Dr. Gerard Martin, please. Assalamu alaikum and good evening to all of you in United Arab Emirates and I would like to thank our course organizers uh, for inviting me to speak in this the 10th annual Neonatology Conference, the hottest topics in Abu Dhabi. I especially like to congratulate uh, Drs. Khan and Dr. Rahmani for this being their 10th year of this wonderful conference that the Children's National Hospital has been able to be engaged with. We so much appreciate being part of this special conference every year. I'm, I'm a, a little bit sad and I'm sure Dr. Khan and Dr. Rahmani are in that this was the year in which I had promised that I would come and speak in a Kandora. And because I'm not there live and in person. Uh, my Candora will have to wait until the next meeting. What I've been asked to speak with uh, or speak about today is about 
the new guidelines for pulse oximetry screening for critical congenital heart disease. During this talk, I'm going to track the screening program from concept to policy. I'm then going to tell you a little bit about the new recommended simplifications to the screening algorithm. I'm gonna discuss some current global needs and challenges around screening and talk about opportunities for improving global congenital heart disease care. Pulse oximetry screening began as a concept in 2002 with this article by Hoke. This was a group of investigators from Johns Hopkins University who showed that performing routine pulse oximetry in the nursery added to their ability to capture all babies in their nursery prior to discharge with critical congenital heart disease. Their paper was followed by a paper in Florida and in Long Island that also showed practical benefit to adding pulse oximetry screening. Unfortunately for probably the next eight or nine years, the United States effort was lacking. Research really moved to Europe, in particular the Scandinavian countries, where some key articles identifying the problems around failed detection, the ability of pulse oximetry to add to the identification, and the sensitivity and specificity of screening really came to bear. On the basis of this strong European literature, the Secretary's Advisory Committee began to investigate pulse oximetry. We had the first uh, uh, expert panel that met in Washington, D.C., where we devised an algorithm for the United States. That paper was published in Pediatrics, and within a year of that manuscript, we were able to receive endorsement from Health and Human Services to add pulse oximetry screening to the newborn panel in the United States. But more importantly, we also got all of the major scientific, scientific societies to endorse pulse oximetry screening. Since then, a lot of work has continued. This is a Cochrane analysis that was published by Andy Yours group. And Andy and his group looked at all of the major studies in pulse oximetry where one could accurately assess sensitivity and specificity. And as shown here, one can see from a rock curve that pulse oximetry operates in an area of moderate sensitivity and very high specificity, nearly one. So again, this is a very sensitive test, but even better than that, it is a test with high specificity, that is reasonably able to capture all of the conditions and very few false positives. And this is a listing of some of the papers from around the world that Andy's group used in their Cochrane analysis. Following the US recommendations, we were able to work with a group of European experts led by Paolo Manzoni. And it was, I was very pleased to see that Paolo was giving one of the opening talks in this meeting. Paolo is not only an infectious disease expert, but uh, a world-renowned neonatologist. And he was able to bring together members of each of the major scientific organizations in Europe to this group of experts, and we were able to generate a statement for the EU. And essentially, we did recommend that all European countries adopt pulse oximetry screening, that they use motion tolerant new generation equipment. Unlike the US, the European model was going to recommend screening after six hours and before 24 hours of birth. Like the US model, they did recommend screening both the hand and the foot. Now, what has happened since then? Well, since then, we've been able to start to see 
the benefits of screening. This is a paper by a book working with Matt Oster, a colleague of mine, in which they and their colleagues at the Centers for Disease Control looked at the association between state implementation and early infant cardiac deaths. And what they were able to show is that states with a mandatory policy here in the yellow had lower morbidity, lower mortality from the beginning. And over time, as they implemented pulse oximetry screening, they had a further reduction in infant mortality. In comparison to states that had either no policy or a mandatory policy that hadn't been begun or a non-mandatory policy. These states all had higher mortality and showed no improvement over the time period. It's quite impressive when you look at the, re the results in those states with mandatory policy, there was a 33% reduction in deaths between infants with critical congenital heart disease between one day of age and six months of age. Surprisingly, there was an additional benefit for children with other or unspecified congenital heart disease where they had a 21% decrease in mortality. Things have not changed between what we consider the core critical congenital heart defects and the secondary conditions. As was initially shown by Anne Grinelli in Sweden, not only are we able to detect the critical congenital heart defects, but many other secondary conditions that are important, hypothermia, infection, sepsis, lung disease, persistent pulmonary hypertension, which were originally called false positives, but now we like to refer to them as secondary conditions. Now, it is still impossible to pick a perfect algorithm. Of course, looking at the rock curve, a perfect algorithm would occur up here with 100% or a sensitivity of one and, of, and, a, and a perfect specificity or a false positive rate of zero. That would be our best situation. And unfortunately, there is no test that performs in that way. But as shown here in this green with the red dot, the red dot is where the Cochrane analysis puts the sensitivity and specificity. And in the green circle are the ranges of sensitivity and specificity from the major studies. In other words, it is not a perfect test. There are some false negatives, but the number of false positives are exceedingly low. In 2018, after we saw the results of Matt Oster's paper in the CDC and the improvement in mortality, we decided to have an additional stakeholder meeting. These individuals represent all the major scientific societies in the United States. They also represent governmental organizations that have a, a stake in CCHD screening, our NIH, FDA, CDC, HHS, all represented. And what we wanted to do is to see if we could improve the protocol at all, or to see if there were other things that we might consider moving forward with pulse oximetry screening. The first thing we did is we looked at the various protocols shown in this top chart. The pediatrics one here, two extremities, 95 pulse oximetry in either the upper or lower, a difference of less than or equal to three for a, a pass, two rescreens, and screening after 24 hours. Compared with New Jersey, that went to 95 in both extremities, a little bit of higher bar to pass, whereas everything else was the same. Tennessee simplified it. They said, we don't think you need to do two extremities, they only screen the foot, but they want the foot to be at least 97 for a pass. And they really don't go 
and repeat just the foot. If you fail that first screen, they then move to the P American Academy of Pediatrics protocol of doing two extremity before failing a baby. Grinelli, much closer to the US. You're a little bit more restrictive in that you can only have less than or equal to two difference between the upper and lower extremity. And like Poland and Germany, Andy and his group have eliminated the second rescreen. Now the issue with all of these is because of the numbers, it's hard to pick the best one. And it's hard to really say with any kind of certainty whether one of these is better given this sensitivity that you're seeing. How about, is there a best time to screen? Well, we do know earlier timing increases the number of test positives and thus the risk of more false positives. Now, Andy Ewer has pointed out in their experience, not all test positives need an echo. And in fact, in his experience, only about 29% of babies that test positive move on to an echo because they, with some certainty, have been able to find other explanations for the child's failing pulse oximetry screen, whether it's infection or PPHN, TTN, they're able to find those babies, get them into treatment, and avoid the cardiac testing. What we do know, though, is because those are considered false positives, that Europe has a higher false positive rate of 0 0.5 compared with the US, which is 0 0.05. For that bump in false positive rate, though, they do have a better sensitivity. The sensitivity in Andy's group is 84, compared with most of the US studies at about 77. Andy points out, and it's an important point, that the earlier timing may catch babies before symptoms develop. And in his experience, 50% of babies develop symptoms before testing after 24 hours of age. So many of the babies are already symptomatic and may even miss their pulse oximetry screening and go into a evaluation and treatment mode. So let's talk about measuring these screening tests. Now let's talk about test positives. So if you're a test positive, you could be a true positive or a false positive. Obviously true positives, we're not too worried about. That's our, our goal. But these false positives, I don't think they're really an issue. And if you look at specificity in nearly all the studies, it is very close to 100%. And if you look at each of these studies, again, 28 to 79% of the false positives had other pathology found. Look with a little more detail at Andy's data with 26,000 births almost. They screened at a mean age of around seven hours. Most were after 12 hours. They had 208 test positives or about eight per thousand live births. And critical congenital heart disease was found in 17 or about 8% of those babies. He does note that they did miss two babies with critical heart disease. What about those test positives. If you look at the test positives, 21% were really true false positives. They had no disease. 8% were congenital heart disease, and the other 71% were babies with secondary conditions that one wanted to know about. And he goes on to say that since putting in pulse oximetry screening, they've had no baby collapse in the postnatal ward. What about test negatives? So here's the rub. A test negative can be a false negative or it can be a true negative. We're not going to worry about true negatives because they're going to go on and get normal care. The false negatives have been shown in multiple studies starting with Grinelli's to be really the left heart obstructive conditions, co-arc, interrupted aortic arch, 
in some babies um, with a synodic tetralogy of Fallot. This is a cartoon from Dr. Rudolph's textbook. And this is actually a baby with saturations filled in from the newborn screening. This baby had 96% saturations in the upper and lower extremities. And as you can see, this baby has the substrate for coarctation of the aorta. There's ismic narrowing. There's already some indentation with some mild ductal constriction. But because the ductus arteriosus is still moderately patent, there is still unrestricted flow to the lower extremity. The ductus is predominantly left to right and the child has normal saturations. But what happens as time goes by? The baby's discharged and over the next several days, as the ductus begins to further constrict, it results in a further worsening of the coarctation so that this child now is going to be symptomatic. This is disease in progress. And if that ductus is still there and it was on admission to our intensive care unit, the ductus is gonna reverse shunting. It's gonna go right to left because the baby's left atrial pressure and pulmonary artery pressure are going to go up. And this baby on admission had a failing test because now the anatomy had changed and altered and as such the physiology allowed the pulse oximetry to identify it. What we did with our stakeholder meeting in 2018 is to look at the conditions that one might think have the highest sensitivity in an effort to let neonatologists and pediatricians know which of the conditions that they probably will catch, they may catch medium sensitivity, or are likely to miss low sensitivity. And again, the low sensitivity, the acyanotic tetralogy, the coarctation that's evolving, Epstein's, which may have varying degrees of severity and may not be cyanotic, and interrupted aortic arch and also double outlet right ventricle, triatresia, and critical aortic stenosis, which all around the time of testing may have a patent ductus arteriosus that hides the abnormal physiology. So at this stakeholder meeting, we considered five questions, five potential changes to the algorithm. These are the five questions we asked. We then had our audience, after scientific evidence presented, vote whether they would recommend these changes or recommend them. The two things that our experts felt could be changed was changing the lower limit of saturation to 95% for both the pre and postductal measurements. This will result in a little bit higher sensitivity it may cause a few more false positives, but our feeling was at this point in time, the evidence showed that, that false, those false positives were not significant. And we also felt that the algorithm was confusing by having a saturation difference between the upper and lower extremity for passing. So this simplifies and we hope will avoid errors in interpretation of the results. We also voted for eliminating the second retest. And I'll show you a little bit of that information. We did not recommend screening just the lower extremity. We did not recommend the UK post and preductal differential saturation of 2%. And we did not feel that we are ready to begin screening in the first 24 hours of life. This is data that helped us eliminate the second rescreen. This is from, uh, from Matt Oster, and it's babies born in the metropolitan Atlanta area. There are over 77,000, 99% passed their pulse oximetry screen, 18 failed right away for pulse oximetry less than 90%, and 16 failed after three tests. That's 34 total failures. 
Uh, of those, there was a baby with critical congenital heart disease and 10 with non-critical congenital heart disease. And there were, uh, the rest were conditions otherwise specified as, as the, you know, sepsis, TTN, and some true uh, false positives. Now, what Matt asked was what happens if we simplified and went to this protocol at the bottom, which is only one retest. And what he showed is that eliminating the second repeat screen marginally increased the fa false positive rate to 0 0.054 without really changing the false negative screenings. And I think this really shows it best here. If you take the initial screen, 77,000 babies, the majority pass, 18 failed straight away. Of those that needed a repeat screen, 149 passed on the first repeat with only 25 needing another screen of which 16 passed on the final screen. So, all in all, there was not a tremendous number more that ended up with being test positive. The other way of looking at this is that with the original algorithm, there were 34 total positive babies. And by eliminating that repeat screen, that went to a total, total positive of 43. And again, sensitivity didn't change, but the false positive rate went up from 0.04 to 0.05. And that's where we have now come up with uh, this uh, algorithm with only the original screen and only one retest. If you're wondering about how to do this or further details, I would direct you to the publication in pediatrics. One of the nice things they have as part of the AAP publications is a video abstract, which also uh, demonstrates this revision quite nicely. Our expert panel thought there was a case for improving education, not only in the United States, but around the world. What we found in a survey that was done with our colleagues at Harbor UCLA Medical Center was that about 51% of hospitals identified that they were not able to always uh, follow the recommendation for a failed screen. Uh, we also found that protocol adherence in these hospitals was quite variable. So from our original publications to now, we have the sense that a number of hospitals are deviating from the recommendations and which is going to create problems with standardization and proper uh, evaluation of this screening test. We want to remind folks that if you do fa fail pulse oximetry, timely referral for cardiac evaluation is important, in addition to considering the other possibilities as the sepsis and respiratory issues. Now we're going to move on to the issue of global CCHD screening. It's been amazing the progress we've made in getting recommendations for screening around the world. This, the, the parts of the world that have recommended screening are shown in purple. Uh, recommended screening doesn't mean everyone is being screened, but there is at least a recommendation to screen. The gold or yellow areas are areas in which there are multi-center studies. Uh, a blue interest in screening and gray where we don't know what's happening. There's been a tremendous amount of publications, Bosnia, Paraguay, Europe, Denmark, Italy, China, India, 
Pakistan, Thailand, Saudi Arabia, Sri Lanka, Sydney, Australia, Turkey, and Spain, where benefit has been shown from pulse oximetry screening. This is a picture from a 2019 workshop in Rabat, uh, where we were able to go uh, to a meeting endorsed by the Moroccan Ministry of Health. We had 140 participants from 20 countries from the MENA region. And we were there to provide a four hour workshop, workshop devoted to CCHD screening. During that uh, workshop, our collaborators at the Morocco Marrakesh Mohammed VI University Hospital present, presented their 10 month pilot data uh, from the largest maternity ward in Morocco, and I think one of the largest in Africa itself. And they screened 8,000 babies during that time period, uh, most of them under 24 hours age. And of those, the, the majority passed. They had 15 failures or about 1.8 failure per thousand live births. Uh, the majority of the failures had, uh, had congenital heart disease, 10 out of the 15, five of them, the so-called false positives, three of which had other pathology and only two that were normal. And they really felt that pulse oximetry added benefit to their patient population in Morocco. Uh, this is a study from Thailand where they essentially the results are very similar to United States. They used the US protocol. They looked at 11,000 newborns and they found sensitivity and specificity that was high for pulse oximetry screening. Here are the results. Pulse oximetry sensitivity, 82%. When added to the physical exam, it went up to 99%. Australia and New Zealand, even though they do not have a country recommendation, a, uh, a survey of the hospitals revealed that 77% of the hospitals are screening in Australia and New Zealand, quite impressive. China now has a national recommendation to screen and 28 out of 31 provinces are screening. In 2019 alone, they screened 2 million babies. And by their report, they found 9,451 infants with congenital heart disease. Now I wanna talk a little bit before we end on disparity in congenital heart disease. This is information adopted from the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals in 2016. Those goals are looking to reduce mortality in neonates to less than 12 per thousand births and reduce the mortality of children to less than 25 per thousand live births. They want to reduce premature mortality due to non-communicable diseases by one third by 2030. And the issue is, this is going to be a failure. Congenital heart disease accounts for one third of the birth defects occurring in children. And 90% of children with congenital heart disease are born in locations with little to no care options. How will we reduce mortality without addressing congenital heart disease in the developing world? We worked with the IHME, it's a group in Seattle, to really try to take their global burden of disease model and modify it for congenital heart disease. This slide here shows the death rate per 100,000 in a population for congenital heart disease under a year of age. Here in the red are the high SDI countries, high socioeconomic countries. The high countries in 1990 had already achieved a low mortality. And over the last 26 years, that mortality has continued to improve. Here in the orange are the low socioeconomic countries. They have a high 
baseline mortality in 1990. And look, over this time period of 26 years, there has been no improvement. And looking even at the middle SDI countries or high middle SDI countries, their mortality is still high and the improvement not as great as with the high socioeconomic countries. What does that mean? Well, let's look again at the high SDI countries. If you look at the congenital heart disease as a percentage of deaths, back in 1990, congenital heart disease accounted for about 12% of deaths in children under a year of age. That has dropped by a third to nine. Look at all, all the other countries. Here's the globe. So just global, the rate was about three. And it has, if anything, risen. Look at the high middle, a rising proportion of deaths in children under a year of age from congenital heart disease. The other way of saying it is that if you look at all the reasons why children die in the first year of life. This is just in the low socioeconomic countries. Again, a lot of prematurity, infectious diseases, uh, birth trauma, uh, infections again, hunger, sepsis, okay? With improvements in water and maternal education, a lot of these conditions are decreasing in significance, but congenital heart disease, which was the 13th most common cause of death, has risen to the eighth most, most common cause of death. The other way and final way of looking at it is years of life lost. About six years ago, I was at the WHO offices representing uh, cardiologist from the United States at a NCD meeting where they were looking at how to decrease death from heart disease in the world. And the focus I can tell you was all on adult conditions, predominantly atherosclerotic heart disease and stroke. This slide shows the years of life loss over here from congenital heart disease in purple, compared with the years of life lost from ischemic heart disease, hypertensive heart disease, stroke, and congenital heart disease, hands down, is the most common cause of years of life lost than all of the other types of heart disease combined. The United Nations, the World Health Organization will make no improvements in mortality in under a year or childhood until they address the global disparity within congenital heart disease. Finally, I'd like to thank my collaborators, uh, my collaborators at my hospital and at Children's National, my international collaborators, Paulo, it's great to have you here on this, the 10th uh, Hottest Topics meeting. And uh, I, again, want to congratulate uh, Dr. Khan, Dr. Rahmani, and the MENA and Saha teams for their commitment to this wonderful lecture. I'm so sorry I'll be, I'm not going to be there. Uh, inshallah, the 11th annual. Thank you very much, shukran, and good night. Wow. Your wow, Martin, was how it ended. I didn't have to stop recording yet.
thank you very much, Dr. Dr. Martin. This was a great talk, uh, as expected. Uh, thanks for updating us about a uh, recent update about this critical congenital heart disease screening program. Our next speaker is Dr. Lemia Sogier. She is a medical director of the Neonatal Intensive Care Unit at Sheikh Zayed Campus of Children's National Health Systems. She has been formally trained in quality improvement through the Cincinnati Children's Hospital. She has been in NICU quality and safety officer since 2013. And she oversees multiple quality and safety initiatives and has collaborated in clinical multi-center quality improvement projects within the children's hospital neonatal consoriums. Today, she is going to give us talk on postpartum depressions. Are we paying attention? Over to you, Dr. Lamia, please. Good afternoon um, and good morning from Washington, D.C. I hope everyone is doing well. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me uh, to talk to you about uh, postpartum depression in the NICU. Um, I'm gonna, uh, wanted to, to talk to you guys about uh, the work that we've been doing over the last five years here at Children's National, both in the neonatal and intensive care unit and in the emergency room um, on behalf of uh, Dr. Jarvis and also on behalf of the Perinatal Mental Health Task Force, which is a, a group of uh, 40 dedicated clinicians, including social workers, um, pediatricians, NICU docs, emergency medicine docs, psychologists um, that do this work in our hospital at Children's National in DC. Um, I wanted to uh, show you my disclosures, but also to, um, to talk to you a little bit about the tremendous uh, effort, uh, that not only that goes into it, but also the faith that uh, the funders um, of the, the, this project over the last five years um, have instilled in, in us. And um, it's the funding for, for a lot of these projects is coming not only from the government, but also from internal uh, grants within the Children's National and also uh, from private uh, donors um, who are very interested in the interaction or the um, global, uh, global work on both maternal health and uh, children's health. And one of the things that you're gonna hear from me uh, consistently is um, healthy mothers, happy babies. So in order for us to get good outcomes in the NICU or in the children's hospital, we also need to take care of the families and in particular the moms and also the dads. So what I, what I wanted to talk to you about um, is, is something that for a lot of pediatricians and neonatologists may not be directly in the scope of your work. Um, but I wanted to make the case for why it is important for you to uh, pay attention um, and to get ready for uh, taking care of uh, postpartum depression. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the prevalence and also the risk factors, but I also wanted to walk you through some of the strategies that we've applied in our NICU um, and in our hospital to support parents uh, during and after their NICU stay. And I wanted to start with a, um, uh, a case, uh, and this was a real case that, um, that, that happened. It happened to circulate a, a lot amongst our uh, task force and amongst our group. And it relates to, um, to, to, relates to a mother who uh, had just had a normal baby, was going to her obstetrician um, at about four months out after the, the birth. And she, uh, she was feeling these symptoms of anger and, 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 and violence. And she recognized it herself, uh, called the, the nurse practitioner, told them a week in advance that she's coming in, especially for postpartum depression. Um, and was ver very uh, upset when uh, the provider went in and, and what ended up happening was the, the mother ended up uh, being escorted to the emergency room after the police were called. And it kind of struck a chord with us all. Um, a lot of things could have gone right in this scenario, but a lot of things in this case went wrong. And she, she happened to post it on Facebook in 2018. And you, you guys can read her comment. 
Um, but it highlights to, to us something that, uh, when I was preparing this talk, something that kind of um, that resonated with me. Why are you interested? Why do you care? You know, the OB is going to take care of it. And, and, and what happens is, you know, we, we're starting to realize from our experience that, first of all, a lot of, a lot of the uh, obstetrician offices aren't uh, fully equipped to deal with uh, postpartum depression. Um, number two, that it can go on for a while, um, three to four months. And a lot of the times, the three to four months for a NICU baby, they are spent with the parents, with the families, uh, with the baby in front of our eyes. Um, and then the third chord was, you know, uh, we, we really don't have a good system to manage and we don't know what to do. And is there a role for um, education or setting up systems uh, that would allow us to uh, handle this condition a, a lot better than we do? So not only is, um, are, the, are, are the, the, the patients telling you how bad they're feeling, but it's also um, been uh, a feature in our news here um, for a while now. And you can see these are articles from the Washington Post, from CNN and from National Public Radio. And they're very recent all the way up to 2018, um, 2017 and 2018. And a lot of these stories um, resolve, revolve around um, mothers who, who have committed suicide or have actually died because they're not getting the attention that they need and uh, the opportunity for us to, to screen moms and how we're going we're gonna to get that done. Um, and it, it, it's not only, again, the OB's um, uh, issue, like, we, like the, the, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists has issued strong statements, but also the American Academy of Pediatrics and Family Practice, they're also issuing strong statements around screening for postpartum depression. So it's on all of us. So let's put it into perspective. When you think uh, of uh, postpartum depression, um, if you start off with major depressive disorders, uh, where in adults, both men and women, the incidence is about 6.7%. In general, that translates to about 15 million adults, both men and women who will suffer from depression in general. Um, over a woman's lifetime, she is probably twice as likely to have a uh, depressive disorder or depressive symptoms than, than, than a man. Um, when you look at the postpartum or the peripartum period, so the third trimester and going into um, the first six months and even the first year after birth, um, the incidence is about 15%. So about 400,000 women a year will develop this condition. And then add to that the stress of being in the NICU, both full terms and preterms, uh, preterm kids, and the incidence rises to about 28%. Um, and there is literature, uh, several papers out there um, noting that preterm moms tend to be more affected than full-term moms, and, and the incidence then rises to about 33%. And to put it into context of, you know, for you guys, even for uh, looking at our current situation with COVID, the incidence of COVID right now is about 5%. So this isn't a small um, in, in general, it isn't a small proportion and you're very likely to have run into this in your NICU or in your hospital. And uh, you may or may not even have, have recognized this going on in the mom. Um, if you put that into context, so the 15% of uh, peripartum um, depression, if you put that into context, it actually looks like one in seven women. And, and again, ACOG has uh, issued um, issued clear guidelines that at least once during the perinatal women, the um, perinatal period, pregnant women should be screened. So um, what does it look like? What, what will it look like um, in your NICU? So again, we're looking at um, the picture of, you know, a young woman who's just given birth. And, you know, this is what, what, what she should really look like. You know, she should be happy. She um, you know, our partner's there, um, life is good, you know, the nine months are over and, um, and, and everyone should be feeling, uh, feeling happy. But unfortunately with postpartum depression, a lot of these moms, that feeling is of guilt. You know, they are feeling that because I'm not having those feelings of happiness and joy, that there's something wrong with me. And that, and that's kind of what we're talking about. I wanted to take a, a moment to, to differentiate between, um, something that commonly you will see, it's called baby blues. About 50 to 80% of women will have this after childbirth. Um, about five days after delivery, it, they start to feel that they are um, tired, um, they're irritable, 
um, it, 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 it relates a lot to kind of getting adjusting to um, breastfeeding, getting adjusting to, you know, if you've had a C-section, the pain of the C-section, it's temporary. It's mild, it doesn't interfere with caring for the baby and, and it kind of tends to dissipate after. So that tends to be one end of the spectrum. We call that baby blues, it's very transient and, and usually, um, usually not, not something that uh, moms will report. And this is also one of the reasons why we don't screen uh, for postpartum depression that early. On the other end of the spectrum, you will notice that there is um, something called postpartum psychosis. And this is a very rare condition. It occurs in uh, one to three out of every thousand women. Um, and, and usually associated with a, bi with a history of bipolar disorder and, and uh, will manifest with paranoia, uh, hallucinations, delusions, and even suicide or homicide at that point. And those are the stories that usually make the headlines and, and will, um, will be reported in the press. Uh, but, the, but again, those tend to be very rare. What we're talking about is essentially um, postpartum depression that, that is kind of midway in, in the spectrum of all of that. And as you can see, this is a laundry list of symptoms. You can um, touch on any of those and, and say, well, you know, irritability, that's normal, not sleeping, that's normal. The difference is this one tends to persist. You start seeing it at around um, two weeks of age and then around a month, up to six months, even up to a year after the baby is born. And a lot of these mothers, they think that they're going crazy, that they think that this is abnormal. Um, they look at the mothers around them and feel that, um, that something's wrong with them. Um, and this is essentially kind of the crux of postpartum depression. What does it look like for you in the NICU? It, it takes different forms. And one of the reasons we were interested in looking at it was essentially because um, a lot of the parents uh, were, were manifesting in different ways and, and it created a lot of tension with the staff. So the mother that uh, comes to you and doesn't engage, um, doesn't come to the NICU, doesn't wanna take care of the baby, um, is withdrawn when you talk, um, is also not uh, showing a lot of emotion when you're, um, when you're, when you're kind of disclosing how sick the baby is, could be one way to go about it. And, and then the other is also, the other is, um, you know, the incessant crying or even the um, combativeness, feeling helpless and trying to gain control and, and, um, and, and, and again, being very combative with, uh, with the staff. Um, unrealistic complaints is another way to put, um, put it out. Put it, put it there, um, put it out there, and 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 that's kind of what we were noticing in our unit, and what drew us more to uh, kind of dive into whether um, parents are having uh, postpartum depression. Again, it's both moms and dads, and trying to figure out what we can do to help. Now, mind you, um, postpartum depression is a under a big umbrella of uh, something called perinatal mood and anxiety disorders, PMAD for short. Perinatal mood and anxiety disorders also include anxiety, stress, post-traumatic uh, stress disorder, um, obsessive compulsive disorders, and then um, again, bipolar disorders as a major depressive symptom. So we're only talking about the uh, postpartum depression here. So um, being in the NICU adds additional stress. And the way I like to think about the risk factors include um, having additional uh, in three sections, the first is uh, stressors that add uh, to, to your baseline. Um, Preterm births and NICU admission being the, uh, the, the two most common at the top of that list. Financial stressors and unintended pregnancy are, have also been noted in the literature. One of the things that our social workers do when, when we have a family coming in, all our families get screened. And part of the intake process also involves um, understanding if they have a history of depression and anxiety or if they have, or if they're on medications, that kind of gives us also a good sense of um, how to help. Um, and then you will notice the third uh, pillar of that is the low social support. So um, having marital issues, having a non-supportive partner, um, not having family around, uh, which which I think also kind of speaks to a lot of um, family uh, of, of of families that are in the area that that all of a sudden found themselves. Um, away from the grandmother and the grandfather and all of their family supports. And I think this also resonates in the UAE um, where you have a lot of uh, folks that are expats that are coming in and maybe they don't have the social support or the friends or the family that they had at home. And then another big one is um, having uh, low household income. 
And this is a huge risk factor because these moms do not have the means to, um, to get a babysitter or the luxury of, um, of, of other supports that they can do, getting online, um, getting into support groups kind of uh, are, are another example of where low-income families are, are at a disadvantage. And each one of these factors is additive. So um, you can have a preterm birth and low social support and that adds more and likely increases your risk of getting postpartum depression. Well, uh, what are wh why do we care? We care because it does affect the mother, and it also affects the child. Um, the first way that you're going to see it in the NICU is the the breastfeeding. They don't want to breastfeed. They don't want to give milk, and that's kind of our lifeline. This is the one thing that we need the parents to work with us as a team. Um, and then the other one that I wanted to highlight, which is the risk of uh, major depression. So if you do have postpartum depression, the uh, likelihood that you're gonna go on to develop major depression is high. It's also uh, recurrent. So with the next pregnancy, you're also gonna be seeing that in the, in the mom. And then there are long-term effects on the children. So if we take it the other way around, so if you're stressed and, and depressed during pregnancy, you are at risk of having a preterm infant or low birth weight infant. Later on, it manifests as child abuse and, and neglect, um, uh, uh, withdrawal and avoidance in the toddlers. And again, it goes all of the way up to uh, school outcomes and reading. And here it's, it's also notable that dads that are depressed also um, will, will affect their child's um, uh, school outcome. Again, it relates a lot to the home environment and how we're interacting with these kids as they're growing up. Um, we know that to, uh, they have twice the rate of physical problems and 50% of the adolescents will go on to have um, psychiatric disorders. And then the worst outcome or the saddest outcome of all of that is uh, postpartum depression that has not been recognized and, um, and, 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 and has led to a maternal suicide, a mother that takes her life because she's that depressed. Um, when you look backwards at the literature in a study from um, University of North Carolina, they've noted that maternal deaths, when you look at the etiology of maternal deaths, about 20% of the postpartum deaths are related to uh, suicide um, and an unrecognized uh, state of postpartum depression. So currently, what is the recommendation? The recommendation um, from the US Preventive uh, Service Task Force, ACOG, and the uh, American Academy are to screen parents for postpartum depression and the underline here is parents, both moms and dads. Um, and these follow your regular visits at one, two, four, and six months um, and use uh, standardized questionnaires. But unfortunately, we're not, we're, not, um, we're not very good at doing that. And we know uh, from recent studies that only 44% of pediatricians are routinely screening. And even after you screen and you uh, counsel the mother, only 15% of those that are high risk are actually going on to get behavioral therapy or getting connected um, with a psychologist uh, for help. So again, how does this affect me in the NICU? Uh, what are the barriers that NICU moms face? So again, we're pediatricians, but, but I, I don't have the one, two, four, and six month visits. And, 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 and I, I probably don't have the luxury of, um, of, of kind of having the, the referral system. I may or may not have it. So, one, so a lot of the barriers when talking to my colleagues, one of the, the barriers that usually come up are that only 20% of them, their mothers go to a postpartum visit. And this is on a normal day in a regular baby who, um, who's not a NICU mom. So the NICU moms are going to miss their postpartum visit at six weeks because the baby may still be in the unit. And therefore, you know, she, she's not going to the postpartum visit, she's not going to the pediatrician, so no one is screening. The second thing that we have found to be very um, profound is that you can't tell by just talking to somebody whether they're depressed or not. And this is with even the most seasoned social worker that we have. And we've had situations where until we started screening, we weren't aware of, of how the mom was feeling or, or, or what was going on. So if you don't ask, they probably won't tell you. Um, the common argument is that, you know, the clinicians don't have time to screen. Um, you know, I'm running around, I'm taking care of kids on ventilators. Um, when do I do this and who does it? Is it the physician? Is it the nurse or is it the social worker? Um, I may not have, you know, somebody that is trained to do it. And I, and, and, and most importantly, what do I do with the results? So, so now what I've screened, um, what happens after? I don't know what questionnaires to use as a common one. Um, here in the U.S., a lot of the time, um, 
we, we always ask about reimbursement. So a strong motivator for people to screen is essentially, can I put this on my reimbursement? Will I get uh, money back for, for doing this in my visit? And then the common one that uh, pediatricians also face is the visit is too short. There's too many things to do. I need to do a lot of counseling um, with this mother, especially if she has issues with feeding, um, with lactation, with um, you know routine care of the baby that, that I may not get to that. So um, this, this, is, this was published by the, um, the American Academy, ACOG, uh, uh, in 2015. And it gives you a sense of uh, some of the screening tools to kind of tackle that first barrier. Um, the one that's commonly used and you'll see in the literature and in clinical practice and in research is the Edinburgh Postnatal Depression Scale. And it takes less than 10 minutes and you can see the sensitivity and specificity of that one. Um, it is available in Spanish. It's also available in Arabic. Um, and that one, we have a lot of experience with it. Um, the problem with that screen in particular, the last question on the screen um, asks about suicidal ideations. It asks about suicidality. So I always caution with that screen that you need to have a plan in case a mother answers, um, answers anything other than never to question 10 on that screen. Um, and that's kind of where it gets interesting when you're thinking about setting up programs to routinely screen in the, in the NICU or in, or in the office. The other one that uh, we've had uh, a little bit of experience with is the Center for Epidemiological Studies Depression Scale, the, either the 20 item questionnaire or the 10 item questionnaire. Um, and that one is, uh, doesn't have a suicidality question and also mirrors um, the Edinburgh uh, postnatal depression screen. It's also another tool. And also the patient health questionnaire nine, um, if you're thinking about it, is a good one to use. And here is the Arabic version. Um, this was a study in 1997 that validated the Arabic version. It's available online. I'm happy to um, kind of share the links if, um, if you guys uh, would like it. Um, it was conducted on 95 mothers at one and eight weeks postpartum. And um, they, they found that the uh, sensitivity and specificity to other um, depression uh, screens was, was, uh, was pretty decent um, and it is available online. There's also some calculators um, if you guys are looking for something that's, uh, that's quick and not in paper form. So what did we do with that? Um, what, did, what, what were the next steps? So again, you're gonna start screening. So that's step one, um, but what's gonna happen? So I wanted to walk you a little bit through our journey um, with the screening, because that's not kind of where we started. So we started off in 20, um, in 2015, 2016, actually doing a randomized control trial where we were looking at um, babies after, uh, mothers and babies after they go home. And our question was, would, would we be able to, um, to decrease depression and stress uh, post-discharge? So our question focused mainly around not NICU interventions, but after NICU interventions. And we thought that addition of a, a peer, so another mother that who's, uh, bit, who's been through uh, a lot of the NICU issues and frequent contact with, uh, with the mothers within the first year after, uh, after discharge would essentially decrease um, a lot of these um, mood and anxiety uh, metrics and would also improve um, outcomes such as uh, uh, immunizations and, and behavioral outcomes using the Bailey scale. Um, we used, uh, we did a pre-discharge survey and, and medical chart review. So our um, study essentially started at the time of discharge and we used this SD. We also looked at stress and we, um, we analyzed the results. And to our surprise, we found that about 45% of our parents at the time that they're leaving the NICU. So again, we all think that the NICU is stressful and the, and the time to have depression or stress is while you're inpatient. But that was not our finding. When we tested them at um, discharge, about 45% of them had elevated screens. They scored more than 10 points. And this was essentially associated more with parents of female infants. Um, unlike what the literature says about, you know, uh, mothers of preterm infants having higher depression score, we found that in actual fact, we found term infants being 7.87 times uh, more at risk of, of suffering from depressive symptoms, and then near term five times as much as uh, uh, mothers who had babies less than 28 weeks. We also found a good split between men and women. So if you had an elevated score, um, men and women were equal in that sense. And we also found that length of stay may slightly increase your odds of having depressive symptoms. 
And, and when we looked at it, um, you know, discharge from the NICU can be before the two week mark. And we were trying to screen out those that had baby blues and those that, that went on to, act, to have actual uh, positive depressive symptoms. And we noticed that if we screened within the two weeks, 48% uh, had high scores. Whereas if we screened after about 43% had high scores, um, which also um, kind of corroborated um, the fact that our mothers are 45% of our mothers are screening positive for postpartum depression. Um, and like I said, postpartum depression or PMADS is an umbrella. Stress and depression go hand in hand. So for every one point increase in, um, in stress, you also get a, a measurable increase in your postpartum depression scores. Um, so on average, about 2.3 to 2.6 points on, on the stress measure, on the de uh, postpartum depression measure um, for every one point increase in the stress measure. The good news is when we looked at it over time, uh, from the time for months of discharge, we noticed that the two groups are two control and intervention groups. They mirrored almost each other. Um, and that around six months after discharge and uh, all the way down to 12 months, the symptoms will, will fade, they will dissipate. So there's hope. Um, this is not something that kind of uh, keeps on uh, going on. The bad news is we didn't find that um, our peer-to-peer -peer support intervention made much difference. It just naturally declined on its own. So in conclusion, we found that there was a high incidence of 45% uh, of uh, NICU parents experienced depress depressive symptoms, and it was uh, associated with parental stress. Um, the, other, the other thing that uh, was inversely correlated was low social support. So mothers who had high depressive symptoms tended to have lower social support. And that got us thinking about the next steps. Um, so now what? So we've screened. Um, what are we going to do about it? The way that we handle it in our unit is um, any mother that screens positive is now um, given uh, some counseling, is given some resources. We've developed um, a mental health resource sheet. We um, encourage them to enroll in postpartum support international programs um, to go to our local providers. Um, and then we've also realized that we can't, um, we can't just hand off, but there also needs to be after discharge support, which we're hoping that um, the Postpartum Support International and, and referral to psych services will help with. Um, and we also noticed that we, we need to do more. And there are many strategies out there in the literature looking at stress reduction within the NICU and that um, those programs are trying to build resilience in the parents and, and trying, to, um, trying to boost the, the maternal and paternal confidence while they're in the NICU. So that carries over to discharge after at, at home. Unfortunately, not a lot of studies are doing longitudinal follow-ups of um, NICU strategies and, and outpatient strategies. So that, that's kind of an area that's ripe for research. The other big um, step that we found um, was very helpful was collaboration. And I wanted to show you the work that's going on across our institution. So we noticed that screening occurred in multiple settings. Um, the biggest two settings are the NICU, the emergency room, and the primary care pediatrician's office. And we were doing this work. Um, we were doing this work independently. So each person, uh, each one of my collaborators, was working in their um, silo uh, without knowing what I was doing, without knowing what the others were doing. Um, so we developed a perinatal mental health task force based on uh, the social econo ecological model. And here um, we wanted to elevate uh, from just doing individual screening. Um, to, to looking at interpersonal organization, community, and policy uh, ways to, to amplify our work. Um, so in the uh, primary care, um, in the primary care setting, our clinics, um, you can see five clinics here, they set out on a goal of completing uh, the Edinburgh Postpartum Depression Screen at two months. They started this work in 2016 and they went from rates of zero to 20. You can see up to 80%. So in, these, um, in, in this setting, um, the, 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 our clinics are now um, all the way up to 2000 now, we're doing, um, we're screening all our moms that are at two months of, uh, of well child check for um, postpartum depression. Their screening rates for positivity are about 12 to 20%. Similarly in the emergency room, this work was started in 2016. And you can see that um, the 200 patients, 209 patients were screened in the, in the study, but, but, uh, but subsequently after that, we continued to, 
the screen and their our positivity rate is 27% in the emergency room, about 7% of the mothers and 4% of the uh, NICU mom, of 7% in the ED and 7% and 4% of the NICU moms are, are screening positive for suicidality. Um, this uh, tells us that uh, we needed to put more resources and we have more social workers. We've got more resources now than ever uh, through a combined effort. We've developed a manual that um, translates across all parts of the hospital. We meet um, monthly or bi-monthly to, to come up with strategies. We've actually unified our cutoff scores so that way we can compare um, across, uh, across, across uh, venues. On the organizational level, the Mental Health Task Force took up the screening, um, has developed resource tools. We're starting to develop um, connections with, uh, uh, with our providers in the community, so we know where to refer. Um, um, unfortunately, one of the barriers that we often come up with is a lot of these programs um, don't have space for our moms. So you could be, the mother could be on a waiting list for four to six weeks, whereas you know, we all know that she needs um, immediate treatment within the within the week or two weeks at most, um, and that's uh, starting to become a barrier. So we're looking at training and educating our providers in house, providing more psych services within our within our uh, pediatric hospital. We've also been able to share best practices amongst ourselves, um, share data, share screening protocols. We're currently tackling the billing and coding. So again, inpatient is a little bit different than outpatient, where we. Our, our, the way that we bill is bundled. Um, so if we do anything extra, we're actually not getting credit for it. And we also wanted to reach out and develop cultural competency within our hospital. At the community level, we developed a provider toolkit in uh, 2017, and this is accessible to providers in Washington, DC. And we've also um, had the opportunity to uh, develop some training courses and participate in training of providers in the community um, to reach out to primary care pediatric practices that are outside Children's National. Um, and we've tried to integrate with them the, uh, to, to, to have mental health integration in primary care clinics. One of the highlights is um, the healthy steps. And here uh, we're aiming to embed psychologists in the, our primary care uh, clinics to identify and treat um, PMADs. And policy-wise, we, um, we've, we've uh, sent several, several representatives to Congress and to our uh, DC local government to advocate for Medicaid reimbursement. And, and we've been fortunate within the last couple of years that the, um, the, the US government has um, issued um, several acts that allow for um, uh, support of postpartum depression screening efforts and also for uh, the local governments have also supported our efforts and, and we continue to push on with that. So in conclusion, um, our current approach to PMAD, uh, uh, PMADs includes screening, referral, and linkages for these mothers. Um, and our hope again is to screen and support mental health and support um, healthy infants and, and development. Specifically, you're gonna ask me in the NICU, um, we uh, collaborate with Perinatal Mental Health Task Force. We've got 40 providers. Uh, we've gone on to include now the cardiac intensive care unit. Um, we are aiming to increase our universal screening from about 20% of all parents to about 80% of all our parents, including moms and dads, including um, uh, both English and Spanish speaking. We have a study going on right now looking at the relationship between the uh, postpartum depression and resilience. Um, and our theory here is if we increase resilience, depression will decrease. We have a lot of discussions around crisis management and, and how we are going to um, manage the, the mom that's in crisis at, at the, uh, at, within the unit, within the NICU. We've hired more social workers and more support personnel. Um, one exciting thing that we're going to be doing within the next six months is we're going to be offering psychological support to, uh, through a trained licensed psychologist in our unit. Um, and, and that psychologist will also be able to do remote screening and telehealth follow-ups. And we continue to have our parent navigator to provide peer-to-peer peer, peer peer support. Our resource guides are continually being updated and we're offering more provider training to our nurses and frontline. Um, and this is kind of a, an example of, of some of the support, uh, some of the resources that we're providing. Thank you so much for your attention. This has been wonderful. Thank you for spending some time with me this morning.
Well, thank you very much, Dr. Lemia. It was a nice talk. Uh, now, the panel is for discussion. The discussion is going to be uh, about the questions which has been uh, sent by the attendees. And we do not have Dr. Dr. Martin and Dr. John in this live uh, discussion. So I shall just go through the questions and uh, we see what consensus we have. Uh, we got Dr. Junaid, who is quite experienced, and Dr. Lamia. Uh, most of the questions has been asked about, about uh, congenital heart disease. The first question is, uh, if one lacks availability of alprostadil, can we use oral prostaglandin used in Ofsengaini? Do you want to comment, uh, Dr. Junaid, about this? Well, uh, you mean uh, if you, they don't have, uh, we don't have any experience, actually. Uh, I cannot comment much on that, uh, the oral procedural, the pharmacokinetics of oral medicine. I really don't have any experience and any um, uh, idea on that. Uh, so I think uh, we cannot. Not. I do yeah. agree with you, really. Uh, I don't have any experience, and I think that is not not the current practice going on okay. around. Yeah. yeah, that's what I feel. Uh, the second question is about: Do do you consider left arm preductal or postductal? Uh, and some consider it preductal. Uh, well, it, it's it's again a tricky questions. Uh, some uh, most of the time postductal is in the in the lower limbs. And there have been some studies where they have noticed uh, same oxygen saturations, preductal one in the right and the left. But again, there are few congenital heart disease or conditions like uh, pulmonary hypertension where it can be a postductal as well. So uh, I, I practice that I take it as a postductal saturation and usually for the postductal saturation, you usually go for the lower limbs rather than getting confused with the left arm. Uh, you can comment, Dr. Yeah, Ali. Uh, yeah. So the thing is that there's one recent article uh, shared uh, with me with our resident, and it is uh, showed that uh, sometime the left uh, also showing the same postectal. Yeah. And I yeah. think it is the anatomical variation. Yeah, uh, exactly. From the where the ma major RTs are coming from that, but I think for general teaching and general education, we should. Uh, continue with the standard, which is the right hand is only the pre-rectal and the rest of the limbs are the post-rectal. So because the variations can be, but I think if we focus on whatever the standards, uh, it is much easier for uh, uh, the our resident and for our uh, junior fellows uh, working with us. I, I do agree with you. Dr. Lemia, do you want to comment about this? Uh, I can see you are also are practicing in your <laughs> as well. Yeah. Sorry, I did not involve you. Um, absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Sayed. Um, I agree with both of you. I actually am in complete agreement that um, we don't use oral prostaglandins. I would caution we don't have um, experience with it. And, and um, prostaglandin E is the preparation that, um, that we use. Um, the OB preparations may be prostacyclin, so I would caution against, I'm not quite sure, uh, have, I'm not quite sure what the oral preparations are, but I would actually caution against that because uh, prostaglandin I um, is actually a vasoconstrict, uh, um, is, a, is, is a vasoconstrictor, not a vasodilator. Um, so that, that kind of would be, would be harmful in this situation. And absolutely, um, as Dr. Junaid said, um, you can always guarantee that the right arm is preductal, but you can't guarantee that the sats that you're getting from exactly. the left side, you can't guarantee it. It may be, um, it may be preductal, but you don't know. It may yeah. also be preductal. Unless and until you have done the uh, echocardiogram. Echo. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, the next, next question is about uh, what is your experience or opinion regarding pulse oximetry with clinical examination versus only pulse oximetry versus only clinical examination. I think that was question typically phrased for Dr. Martin. Uh, does anybody want to comment about this question? Uh, yeah, actually, this is the question uh, it's raised yesterday also. The problem is happening that uh, sometimes the pulse oximeter is takes some time. And as you know, Ali, that day we are working on that and you also involved in that, that the, uh, it takes one, two minutes, sometimes 90 seconds to take the pulse, especially when you are using it in the delivery room. Yeah, so yeah. 
I think uh, uh, yes, the pulse oximeter is the uh, standard uh, equipment right now, but never underestimate your examination, okay? So you have to have an examination. Now, if you have a conflict uh, between the two, your examination, and then you have to have a third modality. So for example, ask for the echo or for something else, uh, uh, whatever you can afford to do that. So to me, uh, it is the combination, uh, but if you have a conflict, yeah, then uh, it's better to have a third modality, like maybe ECG, might be, maybe uh, yeah, ECHO if it is available. Yeah. Dr. Lemiad, have you got any comments? No, I completely agree with Dr. Janaid. Nothing more. Yeah, no. Well, I was just thinking that question might have been with the context of uh, screening for critical congenital heart disease. So that might be outside the uh, mm -hmm. delivery delivery room. Mm -hmm. But if we if we take this question in, in the postnatal ward, then yes, it's, it's, it's variable. The gold standard is going to be the echocardiograms. Yes, if there is abnormal uh, cardiovascular examination and even that patient have a normal uh, pulse oximeter, over practice in our unit is we usually uh, get the echocardiograms and uh, then see the final diagnosis, why that patient has got cardiac heart murmur, and then we discharge. Or if they have got abnormal uh, pulse oximeter, then obviously they do get. So it's availability of the resources. But again, I think that is an on ongoing question, whether how effectively this pulse oximetry screening program is implemented but there will be some critical congenital heart diseases which are going to be missed. And that is the point where we need to get. And I think for, for this purpose, possibly at the obstetric level, at the antenatal care level, we need to train our ultrasonographer to pick up these congenital heart diseases. And I think they're almost 100% almost can be diagnosed uh, antenatally. And then postnatally, we need to uh, try to provide these uh, service in terms of echocardiograms to be done within, within the first week. That, that's what I feel. Absolutely, uh, yeah, point... absolutely I agree with you, Ali. Okay, well, the, the next question is about, um, that was for Dr. Berger, Berger in congenital heart disease like uh, TGA, where brain gets relatively more under oxygenated blood, is there any scope for earlier delivery to relieve the brain from hypoxia? Well, that's, that's tricky questions, but Again, if we think about what's a, a normal um, oxygen saturation in our, in our fetus is, it is around about 70, 80%. They do not need more uh, oxygen. Uh, so there is no any hypoxic risks to the baby. So I don't think there is, uh, there is any need for early delivery than, than the time. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Ali, uh, that's I, I uh, perfectly uh, agree with you, and I think Lamia also agree with it. Uh, as because the fetus uh, not requiring the saturation of the fetus, as you said, is a maximum sixty, but it can be vary from forty to sixty. So they don't need it that much, and the PDA is well uh, open, so there is no need for early delivery. And uh, many times uh, when the TGA patients uh, deliver, you start prostin right away, uh, they do fine and they get the surgery and the shunts uh, until they get the final surgery. So I think uh, there is no uh, point to deliver these babies um, early. Lamia, you have anything? I, I, I also want to remind everyone that early de delivery sets you up for complications of prematurity. So if we're talking about week early delivery from 37 to 36 week, you start getting um, away from the congenital cardiac um, condition into a, a lot more of the complications of prematurity, even if it is 36 or 35 mm -hmm. weeks. Um, so unless there is a problem, um, the maternal problem where, you know, you have to deliver emergently, I would actually caution, um, caution against uh, early delivery uh, just for, uh, just for that, for, 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 for that. Um, and as you completely said, you know, there is no kind of indication just, just for brain protection. The fetus is probably very happy uh, with, the, with the oxygen level that are in utero um, being provided, regardless of the TGA. Well, thank you very much. Uh, that's, that's what the questions I have got. Uh, I will pass on 
uh, stage to Dr. Junaidu. Thank you very much, Dr. Lamy. It was really very nice to have you in this conference. Okay, so uh, thank you, Ali. Thank you very much to uh, with us with this session and to moderate. And thanks a lot, Lamia. Thanks, uh, Dr. Berger and Dr. Martin. Uh, so I just uh, want to give some final comments uh, before closing the conference. Uh, first of all, of course, the smartwatch winner uh, is a. Uh, oh, it's uh, my younger, like my younger brother, my colleague in from Pakistan is a uh, professor Sekandar Hayat from the Children's Hospital and the Institute of Child Health, Lahore, Pakistan. Uh, so congratulations, Sekandar. Uh, the team, uh, the organizing committee will send you by the courier your uh, smart watch. So with this, uh, it's, uh, I have to thank our uh, sponsors, uh, the main sponsors, uh, Prolecta Bioscience, Children National Hospital USA, Children Hospital of Philadelphia USA, MPC Healthcare, KIC and HESA Medical Equipment. We would like to thank you for sponsoring this. It's a really a uh, pleasure to have a conference like this. Uh, uh, total registrations is uh, over 1500 and average uh, online viewers are more than thousand in 15 different countries. Uh, this conference telecast from uh, the very west from USA to up to very east to the USA. So I think it's a very successful uh, conference and uh, I receive a lot of comments, a lot of questions and a lot of uh, uh, positive, positive feedbacks. So I must like, I must uh, thank again to all of our international speakers who really uh, took some time to uh, make this conference very successful. Uh, have, having said that, inshallah, next year, if uh, the time allows and if the uh, COVID situation get better, we can have a live conference again and uh, we will see you uh, and meet you all of you again uh, like previous uh, nine years. So this is the 10th of our edition. I would like to th thank my, my uh, uh, friend, uh, Dr. Ayman Amani also, and uh, all uh, the organizing committee, uh, which is uh, organizing team, which is the MENA conference led by the uh, Mr. Khalid. I have a special thank to Zandi. She works really very hard in arranging all those with the timings and the lectures from uh, all uh, over, over the wor world, uh, from Australia to USA. I would like to thank Afsal and all his team members. Really, they work very hard and they're still uh, going to uh, work for the period of like at, at least one, two hours to close all, all this thing. With that, uh, I will not keep you more. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so it's a good night from my side. Inshallah, see you soon next year. Uh, all of you, uh, hopefully, live. Thanks a lot.